Today I want to spend the first part of lecture talking with you about Favela Rising, the movie that you watched on Tuesday. Then, so that sort of jumps back into the first part of the semester, or the first part of the syllabus, where we're thinking about uh, slums and urbanization. I want to think about the example um, presented in the movie and try to draw out some of the ways in which we can relate that movie to the things we've talked about. Um, so we'll do that in a moment. After that, I want to go back to Crosby, pick up uh, the readings uh, that I asked you to do for today, um, think further about the question of livestock, and through that, then, the issue of grasses and why grasses are an important part of Crosby's story. And then at the end, we're going to talk, or I'm going to talk briefly about the movie Grass, which we will watch in lecture on Tuesday, OK? Um, Grass is a very, very different movie from Favela Rising, um, but maybe we'll be able to draw some connections and make it all fit together in some interesting way, OK? All right, so here's the update. Next week, there will be map a map quiz in sections. This time, it will be about Europe. I posted the map and the list of items for that map quiz to BSpace yesterday afternoon. Everyone find that? If you are in a section that meets on Monday, there is no school on Monday. It's a holiday. So those sections will take the map quiz the following Monday, OK, rather than this coming Monday. As I said, on Tuesday, we'll watch the movie Grass. For Thursday of next week, I'd like you to read chapters 7 and 8 from Crosby. For the following Tuesday, so talking the 23rd, Crosby chapter 9, and also the essay by Charles Mann called 1491. And just for your information, two weeks from today, the reading will be chapters 11 and 12 from Crosby. Are there any questions? Yeah. On BSpace, under Resources, you will find a list of items. Um, it, it includes the lecture slides, the PowerPoint slides, and it also includes the maps and the items. And the, the map is, is called Map for Map Quiz 2, and the list of items is called Items for Map Quiz 2. Has anybody had any trouble finding those? OK. Any other questions? OK, so Favela Rising, what did you think? Good? Did you like it? Uh, any just overall reactions? Uplifting, depressing? Something else? All of the above? All of the above, OK. Um, let's start with this question. Who can offer a thought about the issue of territory or territoriality in Favela Rising? This is like a sample short answer question from the midterm. Talk about Favela Rising and territoriality. Anyone? Yeah. OK, a couple different ways it's territorialized. Um, you could look at the way that it was territorialized in the slum and kind of like neglected by larger society. OK, within the larger society, thinking about, say, Rio as a whole, you can think of the, the slum as territorialized as a pocket of run-down, poor, perhaps violent, uh, a neighborhood with certain a certain territoriality to it, right? It's got, I mean, everyone sort of knows, the boundaries aren't precisely marked necessarily, but everyone knows that the favelas are a part of Rio that is different from, say, Ipanema, which happens to be right next door to a favela. Okay, what else? Okay, within the favelas, there is a very, very 
uh, important territoriality re with respect to the drug trade, or perhaps more generally, the activities of the different gangs that control different parts of the favelas. And those boundaries, again, although they are not marked in such a way that an outsider would clearly recognize them, those boundaries are extremely well understood by the people who live within the favelas, right? And that's true not just of the people in the gangs. It's true of everyone. They know when they are moving across or, or up against the edges of the territory of a particular gang. What else? Okay, very good. The story of Afro reggae and the music that they played and the activities that they, that they put on or encouraged um, is a very good example of re-territorializing the favelas, right? Which isn't to say that it completely rendered meaningless the boundaries between the gangs, but it asserted a different kind of territoriality and it enabled certain things to happen that otherwise weren't happening, right? It enabled people to move across those lines or um, contest those lines in different ways, right? And again, this isn't just true of the people directly involved with it. This is also true of the, the, the shopkeeper, the woman with the restaurant, who suddenly feels emboldened to what? prevent or, or enforce different kinds of rules about who is going to sit in her restaurant. And that is related in some way to the activities of Afro reggae. Any other thoughts about territoriality in favela rising? Everyone's just going to use those answers? All right, I guess we won't ask that question. What about, um, what about the police? What's the territoriality that the police represent or enforce? What about violence? Yeah. Okay, you've got a bunch of uh, difficult, seemingly contradictory things going on, right? On the one hand, the police, in theory, represent the government, right? The established official government. And we can, I mean, there's, there's the government at the level of the city of Rio de Janeiro. There's the government of the state of Rio de Janeiro. There's also the federal government of Brazil. The police may represent one or multiple of those levels of government, but in any event, they are, in theory again, representatives of the state, the government. And the idea is that they are um, there as enforcers of law, and they are there to enforce the territorial sovereignty of the state, right? Now, all of that is very nice in theory, and we're accustomed, I think, to seeing that type of thing play out in practice more or less in our own society. But here we're dealing with a space in which, first of all, it's not at all clear that the rule of law applies in the favelas very effectively to begin with, right? It's not at all clear that you can count on any kind of official government enforcement keeping of the peace within the favelas. There's a great deal of crime, there's a great deal of violence going on. To make things worse, what we learn in the movie is that it's not exactly clear that the police themselves are in fact obeying the law or enforcing the law. They may roll into the favelas 
in a great big crackdown operation and be perceived from some vantage points as you know, imposing order, sort of cracking down on that lawlessness, that space where the, 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 the state is not sufficiently active or effective. But in actual practice, it's, it's not necessarily from another vantage point. From the vantage point of people who live within the favelas, it's pretty clear that that's not necessarily the case. Right? The police themselves may well be very much caught up in the illegal activities going on. They may themselves be corrupt or breaking the law. And you get this battle, which you can think of as a battle between competing territorial claims or regimes, but it's not it's not as simple as sort of the forces of law and order on the one side and the forces of criminality on the other. It's also not clear that the police even really understand the territoriality as seen from the position of the people who live there. Right? I mean, they, they probably struggle to understand exactly what the shifting boundaries are between the different gangs and their territories, right? And they may swoop in thinking that it's all one big, lawless, chaotic mess and they should just, you know, exert force. But meanwhile, there are all kinds of things going on within those different neighborhoods that complicate their efforts, right? So what about violence? You've got it on both sides, right? What's it doing? Is the violence of the police effective in squelching the lawless violence or the unauthorized violence going on? Yeah. It almost has the opposite effect. Okay. So the, the initially there I mean there's the there's the killing of the police officer it's multiple officers right it's been a couple of years since I saw the movie myself which sparks this um, retaliatory strike by the police in which a bunch of innocent people are killed the idea is the show of force is supposed to you know bring the gangs to their knees or otherwise cause them to reconsider what they're doing but in fact it only incites further animosity on the part of the residents towards the police. If you're a resident in the favela, um, who do you trust more? The police or the gangs? What was that? The gangs. Why? Yeah. Okay. I mean, if you're a resident, you at least know who the gangs are, in a sense, right? I mean, you know what their territories are. You may have a lot of misgivings about what they're doing, but at least their behavior makes a certain kind of sense, right? Or at least compared to the police actions, which can appear to be utterly arbitrary, right? Um, what about economic issues? Let's, we've talked about this politically in terms of the assertion of sovereign claims or sovereign powers over territory. Let's stop now and think about it economically. What's, what's, the, what's the economic situation in the favelas? Yeah. Okay, the economy is dominated by the drug trade in, in the most obvious way is that you can make a whole lot more money getting involved in the drug trade than you can pursuing a legal or legitimate livelihood, right? Especially if you're a young male. 
Does this represent um, uh, an economic development strategy? Yes? No? Okay. Uh, as much as anything else, it looks like it's successful for lack of alternatives, right? It's extremely attractive if you are, particularly if you're a young male and you can't find another job, to get involved in, in the drug trade because the wages are high, certainly, but what else are you supposed to do? The options are not very, the other options are not terribly attractive. Uh, where's this money coming from? Who are the customers for the drug trade? Are they the local people in the favela? No, not predominantly. If there's a great deal of money involved in the drug trade, but the people of the favela themselves are obviously not wealthy, then it stands to reason that the money that's actually paying for these drugs is coming from somewhere else. Any idea where they are? Who are these customers? Well, it could be the United States. I don't, uh, people living elsewhere in Rio are probably the predominant market, right? Probably non-favela dwellers. Now, why is, the, why is the state, why are the police so intent on well, what, what do the police want to do with respect to the drug trade? Anyway, yeah. Okay. The police, in theory, are intent on cracking down and eliminating the drug trade, but in practice it looks as though at least a significant number of them are in fact more interested in getting a part of the action. Why is that? The police aren't making very much money in their legitimate jobs either. So you've got a picture in which there's a generalized lack of sufficient employment or wages adequate to meet the needs of the people, including the police, which renders them extremely susceptible to various kinds of racketeering, bribery, extortion, that sort of thing. What else? Yeah. Okay, and then there's a gun trade that goes along with the drug trade. You might see it as a subsidiary or a, uh, another branch of the economy is the, uh, is the economics of guns and weapons, ammunition. And here again, the police, uh, in theory, they are the ones who have the right to go in and use guns, and the gangs are the people who don't. But in practice, the economics of the situation make it such that the police can in fact become uh, part of those circuits of exchanging guns. They can become a source of the guns that then end up helping to uh, militarize the drug trade and the favelas in general. Um, all right, so this all starts to look extraordinarily depressing, doesn't it? Um, what about music? Yeah? Okay, music becomes an alternative in a bunch of different ways at the same time, right? It's an alternative way to make a living. It's an alternative way to spend time. It's an alternative way of uh, providing education. It has, why do you think this is? Why do you think, I mean, could you have done this with any other kind of activity? I mean, what if you had suggested that you wanted to do this with, uh, uh, I don't know, some kind of like water polo? Why, why, why not 
um, why not skeet shooting? Yeah. It's pardon me. Okay. Okay. It's accessible. It's something that that the folks in the favela have ac can access, can do. Yeah. Okay, it's extremely open in its um, in its participation, or it 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 it, prov it can be an activity shared among a kind of unlimited number of people. Yeah, it's a great way of expressing things, expressing ideas, expressing feelings. It ties into a lot of um, what would what would we call them? Deep-seated cultural associations or identifications, right? What, what, what kind of music is this? Afro-reggae. Where does it come from? Anybody know? Yeah. Okay. It, it mixes in this case, um, African rhythms, which have come, I mean, how have they ended up in Brazil? Well, the slave trade. So you've, you, you have, and this, we'll talk more about this later in the semester, believe it or not, the movement of uh, certain kinds of cultural or musical forms and rhythms and instruments and the ways in which they traveled to the New World with the slaves, and in many ways uh, later traveled back again. In any case, the movement, I mean, reggae we identify with Jamaica, but it's extremely popular and prevalent around the world at this point. Um, they, they, there's a, a way of tapping into um, musical tastes that the folks in the favela obviously share, have, um, but may or may not have a sort of conscious sense of um, why they have them. I mean, how do you get a taste in music? Um, uh, what, what other examples of this kind of mixture of African and Brazilian cultural forms come, comes up in the movie? Yeah. Pardon? Say again? Dancing is part of this as well. There's a, a very important component of it having to do with dancing. Yeah. Capoeira. Everyone know what capoeira is? Talk about capoeira and its role in the movie for me. Okay, it's a, it's a dance martial art form. It's sort of both at once. It uh, can be a way of fighting, but it also can be just a form of dance. You have okay, perfect. Capoeira evolved among slaves in Brazil as a way of essentially developing fighting practices, techniques, expertise, um, but at the same time being able to disguise it as such. Right? If, if the slave owner came around and tried to complain about these fighters, they could say, we're not fighting, we're dancing. Right? There's a, there's a long history of the politics of slavery that are expressed in that cultural practice. What about the uh, what about the part in the movie where you know he's had the surfing accident and the woman in the white dress, right? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. Okay. 
Okay. They have a sea goddess there. I like that. It's like fancy that. And they have a sea goddess. No, I mean, yes, she, she and it's not voodoo. Anybody know more about the history of that sea goddess? It's African. What part of Africa? Anybody know? She is an Orisha. And Orishas are uh, goddesses or godlike uh, entities from an uh, African religion that traces back to Nigeria. And here again, we see this interesting mixture of um, old world cultural practices and you know, sort of as they have evolved and changed in a new world setting. She's the goddess of the sea, and therefore it's appropriate that she would have some kind of, what, power to intervene in this surfing accident, this situation. Uh, what have I forgotten? What have I not gotten to yet in this movie? Any other reactions, things you'd like to bring up? What about the, the children, the little boy? Any thoughts about his circumstances? Something that, um, we were going to watch a number of movies, and one of the themes that will come out of almost all of them is uh, the sort of situation of children and the things that parents need to do, feel they need to do, the issues that are raised by the need to somehow take care of and particularly educate their children. Um, there's, there's a lot of examples in these movies in which um, the, the need to find education, to provide education for their children um, is one of the key considerations in the evaluations that these adults make of their circumstances and whether their circumstances are just or not, right? The, in many places, um, you know, there is education, but it's only available if you can pay fees. You, you're familiar with this, aren't you? Um, and, and those fees may seem small in dollar terms to us, but even when they are fairly small, they represent potentially an enormous burden on the parents, um, and they, be, in part because it forces them to come up with cash, right? They can't just send their kids to school unless they also do a whole bunch of other things that generate the fee payments. Yeah, this is, I don't need to talk about this. You guys have got this all figured out already. <laughs> Never mind. Um, in any case, I would, I would encourage you I'm going to pick up this piece of orange so I don't step on it. Um, I would encourage you to, to, to notice these issues as they come up in other movies, although they will not come up in the movie on Tuesday about grass. Okay. I think I've covered what I wanted to cover. Any, no other questions? Have I left something out? Anything that you thought about when you were watching this movie? You thought, wow, that we haven't discussed at all? No? OK. Let's move on. Or should we take our break now, since we're sort of a logical stopping point? Why, why don't we try having our break now? It's a little early, but five minutes? OK.
Okay. Um, whoops. Um, all right, during the break, I had a brief conversation with the GSIs, and I thought of a couple other things I wanted to bring out about the movie before we move on. So if it's all right, a couple of things. Um, another level of this question of, of territoriality, um, which uh, I didn't bring up earlier, and that is uh, we, talked sort of, we talked about the territoriality within the favelas, which is a sort of small-scale, you know, the turf lines between the gangs. We talked about the territoriality at the scale of the city as a whole, in which the favelas are contrasted with the more developed or whatever you want to call them, affluent parts of Rio. Um, we didn't talk so much about the favelas and their territoriality with respect to an even larger scale of um, essentially the international world of um, philanthropies, nonprofits, um, community development uh, foundations, that kind of thing. I mean, Afro reggae takes off and begins to attract attention, not just within the favelas, not just within Rio, but actually internationally. And part of its ability to grow and, and flourish is that it's able to establish these connections um, that are actually international and attract uh, support at that scale, right? And one of the messages that the favela... I'm sorry, yeah, go ahead. One, one of the messages that Afro Reggae is, is concerned to communicate to the world is precisely that the favelas are not just these sort of cesspools of violence and drugs and guns, right? That they, in fact, are very human places where very innocent, hardworking, uh, virtuous people are trying very hard to make a go at things against extremely long odds, right? And if they can, if they can communicate that alternative identity about their neighborhoods effectively, that actually has uh, some effect, right? That, that can change the circumstances that they find themselves in and alter their relationship um, at all these scales, right? Alter the relationship of Afro Reggae to the rest of the favelas and their uh, residents, alter the relationship uh, to the state uh, locally and nationally, that kind of thing. Also very interesting that they, that the leaders of Afro Reggae insist to these international development people that, no, we can't just sort of you know, distill this into some kind of recipe and then start walking around every other favela in Rio or Sao Paulo or someplace else and, and somehow make it work. It's not, it's not something that's simply transferable um, to other places, even if those other places might look similar, right? There are plenty of international development programs that would love to find the answer, and they might look to Afro Reggae and think, aha, Here's the answer to the problem of the slums, or it's a partial answer. But the folks who are actually there on the ground doing this recognize that it's not that simple, that it's very much particular to their circumstances and their community and the people that they have found and the things that they have done together to move forward in the ways that they have. Did you have something to Okay, okay. It's 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 ex I mean, this is a grassroots movement, and in many ways, it can't continue to work if it loses that particularity, that connection to the circumstances there, and simply trying to extract some kind of abstract formula from their success and assume that it will work someplace else is a mistake, and it's actually a very common mistake. Now, the, other, the final thing I wanted to draw out also is, um, is the moment when, uh, his name is Nelson, is that right? Anderson, sorry. You see, there's a problem of not 
Yeah, I've seen the movie three or four times, but not this year. Um, he's he's in the midst of a of a sort of building battle between the the gangs, and one of the gangs has decided to basically chase him down, and they're sending a whole group of armed guys to go after him, and a lot of his friends are telling him, you've got to get out of here, right? What does he do? He stays. Why does he stay? Okay. He knows that if he runs, if he flees from them, he will essentially confirm in their minds his own guilt, even if it's not true. It will convey a message to them that somehow he knows he is in the wrong or he is guilty, that they do have some reason to be chasing him, and that that will, in fact, make matters worse. And he stands his ground. And he survives. I mean, it actually turns out well for him, right? Um, now, the, the question I would ask is, to, is if you could think about that in relation to questions of authority, questions of legitimacy, how, why is it so important, that you know, split-second decision, that split-second confrontation, why does that have such a power to affect the way people perceive him and what they do? Think about it in relationship to the police, right? And the fact that the police don't have the kind of legitimacy that they would need to be able to simply stand their ground and not and, and persuade these people that they're in the right. These um, these split second sort of micropolitics of these encounters and the effects they can have on perceptions of who's who's right, who's wrong, who's trust, who can be trusted, who can't be trusted, um, and and how that relates to the issue of legitimacy, um, which we will be coming back to in connection with. Um, the state and what the state is or means. All right, now let's go on. Any other last thoughts? Okay, so now we're going to shift gears a little bit. We're going to get back into this part of the semester or this part of the syllabus in which we're um, once again thinking not about Rio in the recent past, but um, the, uh, the history of the last, say, 10 or 12,000 years and Crosby's argument about um, the Neo-Europes and why the Neo-Europeans have come to dominate in the Neo-Europes. I showed you this slide already uh, in a previous lecture. The, uh, the megafauna of the New World, or the Americas, that went extinct as humans made their way, as best we know anyway, from the Bering Land Bridge about 11,500 years ago approximately uh, down to the southern tip of South America took about 1,000 years, um, 11 kilometers a year for North America, 15 kilometers a year for South America. The extinctions that have been found uh, correlating very closely with this movement of people, right? And he says that the, the humans were shock troops for the Neo-Europeans. I've already covered this a little bit. I want to make sure that it uh, makes sense, and then I want to extend this a little bit. So, overkill in Crosby. Summarizing, uh, again, this is material that we actually discussed last week. Uh, the New World megafauna were not adapted to humans because they had evolved in the absence of humans. Human arrival caused or accompanied the extinction of these large fauna, and therefore, the New World lacked potential animal domesticates. In other words, it didn't have the variety, the diversity of large animals that could potentially be domesticated to become livestock. Does that argument make sense to everyone? Are we comfortable with that? The next piece is that the New World peoples who evolved in the Americas after arriving and after the disappearance of these megafauna lacked immune resistance to human livestock related diseases. And this 
uh, again, it, it's, it's built on a comparison between the old world and the new world. And the kinds of, in this case, we're talking about germs that evolved in those two different places, and then how those germs affected the immune systems of the people in those two places. And we're building up to an understanding of why so many native peoples in the Americas died of diseases upon contact with the germs that Europeans brought to the New World with them. Okay? Crosby says, quote, the most important contrast between the Sumerians and their heirs on the one hand, so we're talking about the old world, Eurasians, and the rest of humanity on the other involves the matter of livestock. I stressed this once before. And we want to think about why that would be the case. What were these livestock from the old world? One was the horse, which he says enhanced the mobility, power, military might, and general majesty of humans. And it's, it's true if you read the accounts of the first contact between the Spaniards and, say, the Incas, or the Spaniards and the Mayans, the folks in Mexico, the folks in Peru, um, the, the horse was uh, an extremely important, uh, how should we put it, animal technology, right? And it wasn't just important for the speed and the power that they brought. It was also important just for the sheer terror that they could inspire, right? If you've never seen of a, a horse, you've never even conceived of the possibility of a horse, and suddenly you see a bunch of guys riding on horseback, what do you think they are? How do you make sense of them? Are they humans or not? Are they two-headed something or another's? Do they have four legs or six? What's going on? They're absolutely astonishing, right? We also have pigs and lambs and cows to consider, which provided for themselves while waiting to be called on to provide for their masters. What is, what is this about? Any, yeah. Okay. Remarkable thing about these animals. They're way better than tractors, right? They actually feed themselves. They can feed themselves without you necessarily having to do much of anything to provide that food. Yeah, obviously that depends on the circumstances, where you are. But in many ways, the beauty of these animals is first that they can feed themselves. They can eat whatever they find growing or perhaps discarded. Secondly, they also um, reproduce themselves, right? You, no one's come up with a tractor that can do that yet, right? That can have its own babies that can grow up to replace the parents. It's pretty cool the way animals can do that, right? Um, livestock, depending on where you are and the type of animal and the practices associated with it, can provide blood, milk, and meat for food. There are places in the world still today where livestock blood is an important source of protein, nutrients for humans. Um, leather and wool for shelter and clothing. Manure for crop fields or for fuel. Again, this is um, a remarkable thing about animals. Even their waste is valuable or can be valuable to humans. You can cycle it back through your other systems, whether it's to fertilize crops or whether it's to burn for heat and energy to cook food or keep yourself warm. And traction for plowing. You can put plows on these on some of these animals, and they will enable you to grow significantly more food because they can um, till the soil, right? Pull the tools that till the soil, and you can see the you can see all of the feedback loops that this makes possible in terms of the more food you grow, the more animals you can feed if you are feeding them the food that you grow, 
right? The more animals you can feed, the more manure you have. The more manure you have, the more <clears throat> fertile your fields can be and the more food you can grow, that kind of thing. These, these, this begins to give you a, a sense of why livestock were so important from a simple production point of view from the old world, in the old world. The kinds of surpluses that these animals would make possible in the old world. And there simply weren't analogous animals available to the peoples of the Americas, right? We talked about this before. There were turkeys. Turkey manure can be important fertilizer, but you can't plow a field with a turkey. The ability of domesticated animals, a renewable resource, to create foods for humans out of what humans cannot eat. Another extremely important virtue of livestock is that they can consume foodstuffs that are not foodstuffs for humans. We have not, we don't have the system necessary to live off of grass alone, right? But these animals do. They can, and I mean, pigs and goats, for example, can eat all kinds of things that we don't want to eat. And they can turn that into energy and food and all the other things that we just talked about. On top of that, they also contributed to the evolution of the portmanteau biota. The weeds, the microbes, the vermin, and so forth. Now, this may seem a little bit harder to make sense of than the things we just talked about, right? I mean, the other stuff is pretty obvious. These animals are food, these animals create manure, these animals pull plows, that kind of thing. But this stuff is, is a little more indirect or a little bit harder to, um, or less obvious, right? Why should livestock contribute to weeds? The evolution of weeds. Yeah. Okay, they have a selective impact on vegetation, right? They will eat certain plants in preference to others. Different animals will eat different suites of plants, but if you put a cow in a pasture, it will go around and find the plants it wants to eat the most and eat those, and other plants it will totally ignore. There are plants it will totally ignore no matter what. There are other plants it will ignore until it runs out of the plants it likes more. And then it will start eating them. And so on and so forth, right through the line. Um, similarly, everything an animal does to contribute to crop agriculture creates or encourages the circumstances, the conditions in which um, humans are plowing the soil, planting certain certain plants, they want those plants to grow, they don't want the other plants to grow, but that plowing opens up niches, it disturbs the soil, and creates opportunities for other kinds of plants to grow, and those plants eventually over time evolve such that that is their niche. Their niche is to grow in disturbed soil. Livestock can disturb soil and open up those niches, Plows do it on a vastly more intense scale. And weeds are in many ways, um, what we think of as weeds, are the result over many, many thousands of years of evolution of those plants in those conditions, in those circumstances. Which is also to say that those types of evolutionary processes were not happening in the new world in the absence of these animals. And when the animals arrive with the humans, and enable these practices or cause these disturbances, the niche comes with them, and so do the weeds. And the weeds come not because people did it on purpose, right? Weeds are extremely adept. They have evolved precisely to create seeds that get moved inadvertently by, other an by animals, by humans, by wind, even to this day, you know, a lot of the movement of seeds from weeds happens on the underside of trucks, right? That happen to have driven through, driven along a road, and the seeds actually manage to get 
attached to the truck and move along. And that's why in many parts of the, of, of the western United States, for example, every road will have a little corridor down the, either side of weeds that have gotten there courtesy of the travelers along that road. Microbes and vermin. I can't remember if there's, no. Um, we will go into the issue of microbes in more detail in a subsequent lecture, if I remember correctly. Um, but you, everything that I just said with respect to plants and the ways in which livestock alter the conditions in which plant evolution happens also applies to microbes and also applies to vermin or small animals, rodent pests, that kind of thing, who also find new niches that would not exist in the absence of those livestock. And they become important players in the portmanteau biota as well. So how do we think about human livestock interactions? There are a bunch of different ways we can think about this conceptually. We can think about it hierarchically. We can say, ah, the humans are in charge. They're, they're the ones on top. The animals are simply servants, subordinate to the humans. We can think about it instrumentally. The livestock are just tools. They, pro they allow humans to do things that they wouldn't otherwise be able to do. They augment human productive output and power. On the other hand, we can think about it symbiotically. Everyone know what symbiotically means? What symbiosis is? Yes? No? You're allowed to say no? That's okay. We're talking about a relationship in which they each benefit from the other. That's what symbiosis is, is a relationship in which they, in which both players, both parties to that relationship benefit. They depend on each other, but they also gain from each other. And then finally, ecologically, human and li humans and livestock act as an evolutionary team or unit or force. They act on each other and on their surrounding environments. And that, if, that is perhaps the way we've been talking about it most here, but all of these are potential ways of conceptualizing this relationship. Now I want to switch to grasses. And if we think that humans and livestock have got a symbiotic relationship, we can also say that livestock and grasses have a symbiotic relationship. Or perhaps it's more, more accurately put as a coevolutionary relationship. Grasses have a 40 million year long evolutionary history. That makes them significantly older, so to speak, than the livestock that we're talking about, most of the, uh, the fauna that we're concerned with here. They, grasses have been around for an extraordinarily long time. They are adapted to disturbance from herbivores, drought, and fire. We talked about disturbance regimes, right? The grasses have essentially evolved um, in circumstances in which if they could not survive being eaten by an herbivore, they would not persist. And by herbivore here, I mean a lot more than just livestock. Horses and cows are herbivores, but so are grasshoppers and termites and basically anything that consumes them uh, consumes these plants as an herbivore. Drought, the sort of the, the, the native home of a lot of grasses, um, are climates in which drought is a regular occurrence. And grasses have evolved to survive prolonged periods of um, low moisture. And that's an important part of what makes them significant evolutionarily. And finally, fire. Um, why is grass so nicely adapted to fire? Anybody know? Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, partly it's because it can grow back quickly after a fire, more quickly than a lot of other plants. But that's, that, doesn't, that doesn't help unless you also survive the fire in the first place, right? Grasses, the, the growth points of grasses, of many grasses, are just below the surface or just at the surface of the ground. A fire that moves across that landscape the heat from the fire rises, obviously, and if you can keep your growth point out of that heat, you can lose everything above it, but not die. A lot of other plants don't have that. Their growth points are above ground, they're exposed to the heat of the fire, and they die. Grasses display a remarkable variety of strategies for survival and reproduction. It's the most widespread plant family in the world. Here we get a sense of the, both the variety and the sort of special features of grasses. I've told you already, I really like grasses. I apologize if you find that weird or you, know, you don't care about it. I'll do what I can to persuade you that it matters, but maybe I'll you'll fail. I don't know. Um, you begin to see here, you know, there's the happy Hereford cows um, on the nice green grass. Um, that's obviously uh, a landscape that gets a fair amount of moisture, but notice that um, grasses are growing in all positions on that landscape, right? Different kinds of grasses. The grasses in the nice green pasture where the Herefords are all hanging out um, are different from the grasses growing on the foothills in the background. Um, the grasses down here like the conditions where there's probably more fertile soil and more moisture. They don't mind those cows, provided the cows don't get too out of hand. Um, the grasses up on the foothills are able to grow in circumstances where there's probably much less moisture, completely different soils, probably much less fertile soils. Um, here you get a picture of, these are the root systems of prairie plants. So these are grasses in prairies. Um, the key point to notice, there's actually more plant below ground than there is above ground. If you pull those plants and dry them and weigh them, the, the roots are significantly greater than the stuff above ground, which um, has a number of virtues. One is, you see the growth points there just below the surface of the ground. The tolerance to fire and grazing both are a function of that, right? A cow can come along and eat everything above ground or you know, down to an inch or so, and the plant, provided it gets a chance to regrow, can regrow because most of it is below ground and protected. Um, here you see a picture of a fire. Um, this graph down here is uh, rainfall in semi-desert grasslands in the southwestern United States from 1890 to 2000 um, measured against average. And the reason I put it up here is just to give you a sense of the kinds of extremes that grasses can tolerate. Here you see seven straight years of drought, including one year of extreme drought, followed by the wettest year in the recorded history of the Southwest. These types of extreme variation are characteristic of a lot of the climates in which grasses survive. They can actually, um, again, they can go dormant if there's no rain. They can lose everything above ground. Below ground, moisture is much, will persist much longer. And when they get some rain, they can come back. The importance of grasses here. Now, maybe you'll start to understand why I care so much. Um, five out of the world's 12 leading crops are members of the grass family. Wheat, corn, rice, barley, and sorghum. This is the family of plants from which we have derived the crops that feed us, by and large. Without them, you know, humanity would be a completely different what? A completely different thing. They supply over half of all the calories consumed by humans. They are a key forage for many domesticated animals. And finally, grasslands are critically endangered worldwide. They tend to be, um, well, they're not protected very often. The relative, you know, the respective amount of the world's grasslands that are protected compared to, say, the world's forests is teeny. They also tend to be 
where people look when they think about putting in more fields, new fields for crops. Um, the map in the upper left here gives you a sense of the extent of grasslands worldwide. Um, you also, this is also intended to give you, again, a sense of the diversity of um, animals, diversity of circumstances in which grasses are either the dominant or a co-dominant part of the vegetation of a given landscape. This is all building up to the movie Grass, okay? <laughs> Domestication of wheat. So this is this is a key part in the story of um, in Crosby's story. It's also a key part of Diamond's story if you if you care to read Guns, Germs, and Steel. We have to think about how this happened, why it happened, or, or perhaps more importantly, what kinds of features this plant brought to agriculture, features that both enabled its domestication in the first place and continue to have important implications um, for crops and agriculture today. So first of all, it's an annual plant. If it weren't, it would be what? A perennial plant. An annual plant completes its reproductive cycle each year. A perennial plant does not. A perennial plant may uh, set seed, reproduce every year, but it doesn't complete its entire cycle every year, right? An annual plant dies every year, and then it's, you know, it, it, it germinates a new uh, generation the following year, and it, in turn, completes its reproductive cycle. Natural selection favors plants whose seed heads shatter on their own. What does that mean? Where's the, oh, there's, that's a seed head up there in the upper right. Yeah. Okay, in this case, shatter means those seeds, that's a whole bunch of seeds at the top of a stalk, they fall off on their own. So what? If you're, a, if you're just a grass plant growing on your own, and you know that you've gotta, you're going to die, and your seeds have got to somehow reproduce the following year, and you have no, nobody else intervening. If your seeds stay there at the top of that stalk, you're going to fail, right? Because those seeds need to get off that stalk and fall to the ground or blow to some other place and get to the soil or else they can't germinate. So under circumstances of strictly natural selection, you need to have a seed head that shatters on its own. And whether it's the wind that blows them off, or whether you like sort of self-explode and throw them off, or whether they're very, by the end of the growing season, they're very delicately attached so that anybody, any animal that runs past and just bumps the stalk, they'll fall off, that kind of thing. On the other hand, if you're going to domesticate this plant, the seed heads are also the part you want to eat. That's where most of the energy and nutrients in this plant are located. We don't eat the stalks and the leaves of wheat. We eat the seeds. And if you're a human and you want to grow this plant, you want the seeds to stay on the stalk, right? Until you come along and harvest them, until you come along and take them. If your seed heads shatter on their own, you'll go out there to harvest and they all will have fallen on the ground, and you'll be reduced to picking them up one by one by one out of the dirt, which is it's not worth the effort, right? Clearly. So the puzzle here is sort of, I mean, this, this, on the one hand, this is a puzzle, because it's hard to see how any human wandering along through a grassland would have come to the recognition that the seeds are the part that you want to eat, that the seeds are the part that you can then turn around and put in the ground and grow, and that 
if you start this process, eventually you would end up with a bunch of plants that would hold their seeds on the tops of their stalks, right? Who in the world would have imagined that as, you know, a hunter-gatherer wandering through a field of grass? On the other hand, this is a beautiful illustration of the difference between artificial and natural selection, and in turn, on the meaning of the meaning of domestication itself, right? Domestication is not just somehow grabbing a wild something and putting it in a field or a, or a corral, right? It's actually altering the reproductive and biological identity of that plant or animal. What this means eventually is that you end up with a grass plant that doesn't shatter, its seed head doesn't shatter, and therefore it must be harvested by humans in order to reproduce. A, a, a wheat plant, a grass plant that has this new feature that is so attractive to humans for purposes of domestication is a plant that cannot survive without humans and therefore is fully domesticated. It is dependent on humans for its reproduction and persistence. Does that make sense? You're still not persuaded of the importance and beauty of grasses? Maybe? The point that Crosby puts out there, and this is, again, this is, Jared Diamond takes this whole hog and reiterates it, restates the same argument, is that Eurasia had an advantage, so to speak, compared to other parts of the world when it came to grasses, just the way it had an advantage when it came to large animals to domesticate. 32 of the world's 56 prize wild grasses and prize here, in this case, refers to the, um, the productivity of the grasses in terms of seed. How much seed does a given grass plant produce? And also in terms of its other features facilitating domestication. 32 of 56 originated in, not just in Eurasia, but in a particular part of Eurasia, the Fertile Crescent and the Mediterranean region. 13 of 14 domesticated mammal species were native to Eurasia. Now, um, yeah, the, the size of seed head is also a big consideration. I don't suppose I need to go into that. A lot of grasses have got such itty bitty teeny weeny seeds that they would not lend themselves to useful production as a domesticated plant. Um, having nice big seeds is really helpful if you're worried about producing, you know, quantities of food. What are the ramifications? of this uh, Eurasian advantage. Unequal development of surplus food production is what it comes down to. The productivity of agriculture in Eurasia was much, much higher than in other parts of the world at a given point in time, okay? It develops earlier and it develops more rapidly in terms of output. This results in an unequal demographic and social development. Larger surpluses mean larger populations of people or denser populations of people, a greater division of labor, and more human energy time that can be devoted to other things besides food production. Unequal technological and immunological development, unequal outcomes upon collision since 1492. And collision is diamonds term for it, actually. The collision of old world and new world um, people's plants, germs, that kind of thing. All right. We've got about five or six minutes left. I want to talk about this movie that we're going to watch on Tuesday. It's called Grass, A Nation's Battle for Life. It was made in 1925. It's a silent movie. It's got a very... It's got a very exuberant soundtrack of extremely low production value, but it is not, it's a silent movie. It's about the Bakhtiari, who are nomadic pastoralists. That means they live from their animals and they move significant distances with their animals every year. They do not have any fixed settlements, cities. 
It's made by, the movie was made by Marion Cooper, Ernest Shudsack, and Marguerite Harrison. The movie, the next movie they made was King Kong. And Marion Cooper went on to be one of the fa most famous early directors in Hollywood. Um, King Kong, The Sands of Iwo Jima, Fort Apache, The Searchers, Chang, A Drama of the Wilderness. Um, so this is, this is one of, it's actually generally considered to be um, the second documentary film ever made. What's a nation? Picking up on this subtitle, A Nation's Battle for Life. What is a nation? It's defined as a community of sentiment or solidarity. It's any group of people who feel some kind of solidarity among themselves as such, as a group, right? This can be based on language, religion, ethnicity, history, livelihood. It can be defined by almost any feature of a given population. All that matters is that somehow they feel this commonality, right? They identify with each other as a people or as a nation. It's generally defined relationally. In other words, it's not just that you all have a certain, say, language or religion in common. It's that you have it in common and other people don't. You are different from other people in some important identifiable way or set of ways. So when I say nation, I don't want you to immediately think of the United States or Poland, right? Those are nation states. I want you to, to remember the nation, a nation is not the same thing as a nation state. A nation state is that peculiar form in which the nation and the state become the same thing or somehow map onto each other in a nice, convenient way. I want you to think instead of the nation as at least, well, not only potentially, but frequently a separate thing, a different concept and a different reality on the ground. So the Bakhtiari are a nation without a state, essentially. Their migration every year takes them back and forth between what's now Iraq and what's now Iran. And they consider themselves citizens of neither state. So what is the state? This is Max Weber's definition. We've encountered Max Weber once, uh, once already when we talked about science. Now we're going to talk about something from politics as a vocation, the companion lecture he gave at about the same time. Today, however, we have to say that a state is a human community that successfully claims the monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force within a given territory. Underline that in your notes. Monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force within a given territory. Note that territory is one of the characteristics of the state. The state is considered the sole source of the right to use violence. Now, this term legitimate, which I mentioned briefly earlier, is really important. What the hell does it mean? Successfully claim the legitimate, the monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force. Yes? Okay. Okay. Legitimate here has two interestingly related meanings, right? On the one hand, what legitimate means is the state can kill you and get away with it, right? Or put you in prison. The state has the right to do that. You try to do that to somebody, and yeah, it's not going to work. You're going to get in trouble, right? You're not allowed to just blow somebody's head off. I'm sorry, I'm a little dramatic, but, but the state is. Right? Or at least it claims that it is. And the other kind of legitimate is the part where you ask, well, is that claim successful? Right? If the state actually does it, will everyone else say, oh, yes, very good, nice job. You have enforced the law, you have punished the wrongdoer, and we think you're groovy. Or, on the other hand, is there a possibility, as happens in Favela Rising, that when the state comes along and shoots somebody, Everyone looks at him and says, wait a goddamn second. That's not legitimate at all. That was arbitrary. That person was innocent. You're totally 
you're not being legitimate. And when what Weber is saying here is that if the state claims that monopoly but doesn't gain the support of the people it's purporting to rule, its legitimacy is in question, right? So it needs to be able to assert this claim successfully. And its claim is not just that it can do it. Its claim is also that no one else can do it. The gangs in the favela can't do it. It's a monopoly of the legitimate use of physical force within a given territory. So when we think about a nation state, we have to think about that community of sentiment part. And then we have to think about this legitimacy and monopoly of the use of force on the other part and how they come together. All right, so, oh, darn it. Well, I'll show these at the beginning of class next time. Um, yeah, you've got them in your notes. You can look at them, but I'll run through the...